Hello, this is Kimberly with another demo video for our SQL Skills Insider friends. I've decided to do a demo this week because I was on site with a customer and I found some very interesting behavior from Management Studio. And this is becoming a recurring theme. I'm seeing more and more tools that are really to a certain extent being blindly trusted and as a result they are causing a tremendous number of problems. For example, the customer was going to Management Studio, which we should be able to trust, and they were going and changing one of their clustered index definitions, which is something that is near and dear to me because I often see a lot of poorly chosen clustering keys. So they were actually proactively going and you know looking at their clustering keys and starting to change some of them, and they had decided to change one. They went to Management Studio and decided to change the index definition there. And after three and a half days of executing, they were really frustrated. Now, luckily, this wasn't a production environment. So it was exactly the right environment for them to have been testing and trying this thing out. And it wasn't really high on their radar, which is why they had started it last week or the weekend prior. And then by Monday, they came in, and it still hadn't finished. And they were wondering, what the heck is going on? So it. Uh, luckily, corres corresponded with one of our visits on site. So my point is I started investigating what Management Studio is doing, and I found some things that I really was surprised about. So what I've got here is a database, SalesDB Goods, and I'm going to go in with the schema designer, the database diagramming tool, and I'm going to show you what my tables look like now. I've got a sales table, it's got a sales good, the sales good is in fact the primary key. I can go there and show you from the indexes and keys definition, the sales primary key is on the sales good, and it is a clustered index. Now, what you might think is, wow, okay, all they need to do is go here and say no, and in fact, Really, that's all you need to do. Now, if I just say close and I just say exit, now I've got some settings that will come back and say to ask me, do I want to save and do I want to save the script? But if I say right now, just save, right, it's going to say the following tables will be saved. Do you want to continue? And it just tells me sales. And I've got this option here, warn about tables affected, but it's not really telling me what's going on behind the scenes. So if I end up saying yes, What's going to end up happening is SQL Server, as you can see down here, it shows that it's saving and it's kind of going behind the scenes and we might not even necessarily know what it's doing. Now luckily this table for me is only about 7 million rows, but here we go. So now I've gone and I've started to go through this process of changing it, but it's coming up and it's saying, okay, do I want to generate this change script? And I've set an option already to automatically generate the change script on every save so that's why it's actually coming up for me but let me take this over here I'll copy it and at this point um, I'm gonna say no now I'm gonna go over here and I'll show you what actually has already been executed so scrolling up to the top I don't know why they have a begin commit around session settings but okay and then they have a begin transaction immediately followed by a go which also doesn't really make sense but then we have our alter table drop constraint then we have our alter table add constraint this looks like it's all put together in one transaction and that's seemingly straightforward in fact that is what we ultimately wanted to do. We wanted to change this to be a non-clustered. So really, when you think about it, this doesn't seem like too bad of a um, change. And in fact, if you're just changing from a uh, key, which is not a constraint with a whole bunch of other foreign keys that reference it, it really isn't a big problem. But where you can have some problems is if you end up having foreign keys which reference this. Or even worse, if you want to go in and try to do something more complicated. So I want to show you two things that I think are really important before I go much further. Under Tools, Options, 
there is a section here for designers and then table and database designers has quite a few options I would highly recommend auto generate change scripts and I would highly recommend this one prevent saving changes that require table recreation I've deselected it temporarily so that I can show you a few other things but I think this is a fantastic option there are some changes that if you make them to your schema they can be incredibly expensive so by saying prevent saving changes that require table recreation, you're going to immediately stop some of the worst, most problematic changes. And I'm going to get to those next. So I'm going to leave that off for right now, and I'll show you actually how I'm going to do things without actually executing, executing it through the UI, because I'm not really a big fan of doing it this way. I actually prefer generating a script and running it from the script every time. Now, just to kind of prove my point, I'll do an SP Help Index on sales, and you can actually see that they did go through and change it the last time, even before I got to generating the script. So when I said save, they went and they started running this. Now, again, this table only had 7 million rows. It was only about, I forget how large this table is. It's not too, too large. A couple hundred meg type of thing. So it wasn't uh, an extremely problematic table. But if you tried to run this on a really large table, this could actually take days and days to run. And what's actually worse is if you want to make more significant changes. So let's say we have this exact environment and we've just changed our clustered index to non-clustered and we think, hey, I'm going to go ahead back to that database diagram and I'm going to go over and I'm going to go and add a new column. I'm going to add an integer based identity. So if I go in there, I can change the table view, and I usually like to get a little bit more detailed uh, custom view here and add, if I'm going to mess around with identity, add the identity properties, and we will rearrange to show our diagram here. And I can go ahead and right click and then say that I want to insert a column. I'm going to go here and say sales ID, and my data type is then going to be an integer. I'm not going to allow this to be nullable. Identity, one and one. That's fine. Now, a couple of things that are interesting. If I had just put this column at the end, SQL Server can, for certain types of column additions, do them extremely efficiently and very quickly. But by putting a column at the beginning, I'm actually making kind of a fatal mistake. I'm, I'm putting a column at the beginning and thinking that's the way that it's going to be displayed. And of course, that is the way it's going to be displayed if I do a select star. But if I'm using anything else, I can always change the order of the columns. But by specifically and physically locating it first, what you'll end up doing is actually something that's extremely expensive. And it used to just run in older versions of Management Studio. I'm running SQL 2008 R2 here. I'm not even sure when they changed changed this and added this so be sure to test this and that's ultimately going to be one of my main recurring themes after you see what this does but here this is what I'm going to recommend if you're ever going to want to make any changes whatsoever to your schema don't actually save them at this point go to the table designer use this drop down and go to generate change script now, it's going to tell you, and this is another really good warning that they've added in more recent versions, saving definition changes to tables with large amounts of data could take a considerable amount of time. While the changes are being saved, the table will not be accessible. So this is really kind of interesting in and of itself. But we can actually say, do we want to continue attempting to save? We can say yes, because right now the only thing I've said that I want is to save the change script. Now, at this point, I could just save it, or I could do what I'm going to do here. Here. I'm going to copy it and then I'm going to say no and I'm actually going to back my way out of this and say no. I really would highly recommend that you don't make the changes directly. So now I'm going to go over to the query window and I'm going to go look at what was going to happen. So the first thing they were going to do is drop the constraints that point to my sales table, right? And this is all of them. Right, so they're dropping all the constraints. Then they're dropping my constraint for random goods. They're recreating my table as a temp table. Notice the name temp sales. They're then going to alter my table 
and add my constraint uh, that I had on to begin with. They're going to pull over all of the data from the original sales table. So again, depending on table size, this could take a tremendous amount of time. They're then going to drop the original table and rename this new table. Then they're going to go ahead and add all my indexes back. Now I'm going to actually let this start running. Now in my case, again, my table is relatively small, so this is only going to take about a minute and a half. But the point is that if you're doing this on an extremely large table, this is actually going to be run as effectively a long-running offline operation while it takes potentially hours to run and drop all those foreign keys and add all of the indexes. And even worse, once you drop the foreign keys, if your system and your database specifically is not actually um, basically paused from activity, you could actually get some bad data entered because not all of the tables are effectively in an offline state. So it's kind of a strange, weird uh, situation that you're in. So if you're going to make schema changes, you're generally going to want to do them as offline, especially if they're going to be as significant as this. So like I said, this is going to take about a minute and a half to run. Now what we're going to end up with at the end of this is our new column, our new identity. It will be populated and we'll end up back with our non-clustered indexes. But remember, our ultimate goal was to change our clustered index. And in fact, this is actually what the customer was going through changing the clustered index from a primary key which was on a GUID to make it non-clustered and actually put the clustered index on an identity column. Now the good news is is you know this is doing all this for me. It's taking some time, but what's really interesting is I still don't even have my clustered index set yet. So I'm going to go back over maybe to that diagramming tool, go back over to the indexes and I'm going to go ahead and make a new index, which is actually going to be our clustered index. So I'm going to go ahead and say add, and it automatically names it here IX Sales. I'm going to make it on. It just chose the first column, which is Sales ID. This one is, in fact, unique. This one is going to be created as a clustered, right? And then I scroll down, and I can change the name. Maybe I want to make it Sales sales ID. Okay, so I've got all the settings and at this point again before I run it I'm gonna generate my change script and I'm gonna highlight this copy and I'll say no and I'll say no and I'll get out of all this no 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 and go back here and show you again. Okay, it created my unique cluster index. Now all of this sounds great. I mean, it seems like the UI has really saved me a lot of time. And, and I would have to give it props for the fact that if you have a small database, you can go through this process and you can really uh, let the management studio help you. But the problem is this customer had a table that was extremely large and on a secondary version of their server they wanted to go through the process to find out how long it was going to take which is a fantastic strategy of checking up on you know the tools to make sure that they're doing what you think they should and they went over and they went to do this in production and like I said or not production but on this test server on a production amount of data and it took three and a half days and still hadn't even finished and the reason why if you were to do both of those steps inside the same process SQL Server drops the non clustered then drops the clustered then recreates the clustered without disabling any of the non clusters so let me let me see if I can summarize this here I want to show you exactly what happened in my scenario right so the scenario I just did remember I had three steps I had my first step where I dropped my clustered index and made it non-clustered. Well, you might not have noticed because my table was really small, but anytime you change from a clustered table over to a heap, you have to rebuild all of your non-clustered indexes. Now, my second step was to add my identity column, and you saw that. And if any of you guys looked at that script, it actually created a new copy of my table and in this particular case it then rebuilt the non-clustered indexes again and then 
if any of you caught on the very last script, which I actually ended up not running, I changed uh, to a clustered table by putting it on the sales ID. And guess what that would have done? That would have rebuilt all of my non-clustered indexes again. So uh, this basically means that if you use the UI to go through this process, you're going to end up rebuilding your non-clustered indexes three times, which can take a tremendous amount of time. Now, I've talked about this in some posts and so forth on SQL Server Magazine, and I always mention this in classes. You really need to strategize a lot of schema changes, especially if you're going to restructure the clustered index. And in fact, one of the things that you'll want to study up on if you don't already know a lot about is disabling non-clustered indexes, because one of the most ideal things you can do is actually drop any non-clustered indexes that you are in fact going to change, then disable non-clustered indexes that you're going to want to keep, then change the table either by definition or the clustered key. Now, once everything is disabled, then you could actually drop the clustered, right? Change the table's definition by adding the identity, right? Then we can, I can't type while I'm talking to you, add the identity, then create right the clustered then you can re enable the non clustered this gets even more challenging when this is in fact a primary key but the point that I want to really state more than anything else is that you need to know what the tools are doing you need to do like my customer did which was fantastic that they actually tested this out in another environment luckily it wasn't a high pressure situation where they were trying to run it you know quickly without doing a lot of testing because this effectively would have made their tables unavailable for three and a half days so Oh, and by the way, we did re-architect, and we did do it in basically this order, and we got the whole process done. I can't even remember the exact time, but it was under about five or six hours. So three and a half days using the UI, five and a half hours, and we actually ran it overnight, did a couple of other things to make sure that it was really optimized. But we basically just architected the process, and we came up with a much, much better strategy. So here's my, my number one tip. Always test the tools, which I know you guys do. Make sure that you know what the tools are doing in terms of Management Studio. The scripting option, which is available from virtually any dialog. Like if I even go to a new database, instead of actually creating that database, what I can do instead is say script. So script action to a new window, or if you're in fact in things like the database designer like I was, down in here, before you make any changes, use the table designer option to generate the change script. And of course, if you're using a third party tool, um, or if you're using a tool that maybe doesn't have a nice scripting option, always consider using Profiler to see what's really going on. It's really important and it's going to save yourself you know, a tremendous amount of time and hassle and problems later. So I really appreciate it. I went a little bit long this week. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions about the tools, let us know. Thanks for watching and thanks for being an insider.